Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This will be the start of a new story called Rise of the Twilight Knight. All credit to the author, their information can be found in the description below, as well as a link to the story if you would like to read along. This will be chapter 1 and one half of chapter 2. Also, don't forget to smash that like button and comment to help with the algorithm. It's much appreciated. Now let's get into the story. That definitely isn't something you see every day, even by our standards, stated a woman as she sat next to a man, both of them looking out a window into the vastness of space. Specifically, at the sight of a shattered moon orbiting around a planet that looked to have four separate continents on it along with a smaller, but still large, island. The woman was incredibly beautiful, with fair, pale skin, violet eyes, and long bright red hair that went down to her waist. She wore a long-sleeved black shirt with black robes over it, a black belt that held the robes closed along with having a long silver sword hilt attached to it, black pants, and black boots that her pants were tucked into. Additionally, she had a few pieces of dull red armor on her forearms, calves, and chest. The man had fair skin, bright spiky blonde hair with two bangs framing his face, and blue eyes. He wore a dark blue turtleneck with off-white robes over it, a brown belt with two silver sword hilts on it, tan pants, and tall brown boots that went up to his knees. These two were Jedi Master Minato Namikaze and Jedi Knight Kushina Uzumaki, or rather former Jedi now due to the collapse of the Jedi Order. It had been a little over a year since the Order's collapse during Operation Nightfall, otherwise known as Order 66, where numerous Jedi commanders and Jedi generals were murdered by their clone troopers. Those that managed to survive were branded as fugitives of the former Galactic Republic, now Galactic Empire. Minato and Kushina were among those who had managed to survive and escape being killed, as they were some of the few Jedi that didn't use clones in battle. However, they didn't hold prejudice against clones like Jedi Master Ramkota, who didn't believe clone troopers were suited for battle, despite their skill. Instead, the two found it too convenient how a clone army was discovered just before the outbreak of the Clone Wars, commissioned by the late Jedi Master Sifo Dyas. Remembering how Sifo Dyas had believed dark times were coming, but no one had believed him, yet it seemed he still wanted to be prepared only for him to then be killed in a shuttle crash while on a mission to negotiate peace between several Felucian tribes. So, Minato and Kushina found it suspicious that all these events occurred so closely together, even more so that the clones were programmed to follow any orders they're given, leading to them refusing to be given command of any clone troopers. This refusal ultimately saved their lives when the clones were given the order to kill their Jedi commanders and generals on the order of the now Emperor Palpatine whom the remaining Jedi now knew was really the Dark Lord of the Sith, Darth Sidious. He had managed to hide his connection to the Dark Side and work his way up to becoming Supreme Chancellor of the Galactic Republic before using the political power he acquired from the Clone Wars and the Separatist Crisis to become Emperor. This led Minato and Kushina to go into hiding, knowing there's nothing they could do to go against Sidious now, especially with his new Sith apprentice, Darth Vader. They managed to acquire a Barlas class medium freighter to help move around the galaxy as they traveled through wild space to avoid detection. Yeah, I've seen planets with more than one moon or sun, but I don't think I've seen one with a moon like that, said Minato, wondering what could have damaged a moon like that and still leave it partially intact, let alone leave the planet untouched. You think the Empire came here? Kushina asked, having a hard time sensing anything on the planet if the Empire came here. I doubt it. If the Empire attacked this world, they'd have left some ships or a base here. But you feel it too, don't you? I'm sure there is life on this planet. You can barely sense anything, like, said Minato with a frown, unable to find a word to describe it. Like a wound in the force, suggested Kushina. Not quite. More like, as if there's something artificial about this planet and it's causing interference with the force, Minato said, making Kushina look down at the planet in intrigue that it could have such a presence in the force. If it can hide anyone, Maybe it could hide our force signatures, Kushina said, liking the chance that they'd be able to find a place where they wouldn't have to worry about being found and killed. We wouldn't have to worry if you'd actually prepared to face a Sith Lord, Master. But no, you went with barely anyone, not only getting yourselves killed, but now the entire galaxy is screwed, thought Kushina, cursing her Jedi Master Mace Windu for not preparing more when Palpatine was revealed as the Sith Lord. One thing about Kushina when she had first been taken in by the Jedi Order is that she was noted to have a seemingly natural affinity for both the light side and dark side of the Force, something that had made several Jedi wary that she had the potential to easily become a Sith, making them hesitant to train her as a Padawan in the event she did give herself to the dark side. Though Mace Windu had accepted her as his Padawan, 
given his own affinity to the dark side and developing his own lightsaber style to help him channel it in a way that would benefit the Jedi and the Republic, a variation of Form 7 known as Vapad. While teaching Kushina to harness and control the darkness within her, allowing her to channel it into a force for good. With the redhead also being the first and only one of his students to master Vapad to the point where she didn't require his permission to use it, being able to freely use Vapad without worry of succumbing to the dark side, a feat that not even Depa Balaba could accomplish despite being a member of the Jedi High Council prior to her tragic mission to their Jedi Master's homeworld of Heroin Cal. But during the later years of Kushina's training, their relationship began fracturing due to their differing views on being a Jedi. The Uzumaki began questioning the Jedi's place as peacekeepers and how entrenched they were in the politics of the Republic, with Kushina never hesitating to bring up how the Jedi could be doing more good if they acted more independently, rather than being held back by the corruption and bureaucracy of the Republic. With her free thinking not sitting well with Mace's distaste towards Jedi that are viewed as mavericks by the majority of the Order, not to mention how Mace Windu, along with those like Kyoti Mundi and C.C. Tyan, tended to embody a lot of things that were wrong with the Jedi Order. At least in Kushina's opinion, as she grew older and more experienced in seeing how others acted and behaved in the Order, which eventually led to her and her master falling out after she finished her training and was promoted to a Jedi Knight. Though that's not to say she didn't still care about her former master and mourned his death when she learned what had happened. But the real reason Kushina was peeved at Mace Windu wasn't due to the fact that she and Minato were now fugitives. It's because of how it would affect the life of their son due to him being the child of two Jedi. The two were fully aware it went against the Jedi Code to have relationships that such connections and emotions would lead them to the dark side. But neither of them cared, having developed a bond during their time as Padawans, which only grew over the years until they fell in love. Seeing that the joy, love, and happiness they felt didn't lead them to the dark side. It helped fuel their light and desire to protect, only for things to go from being some of the happiest moments of their lives, believing they'd be able to leave the Order and start a family after the Clone Wars ended, to the worst when Order 66 happened, forcing them to go on the run with their son, Naruto Uzumaki, eventually being born almost a year after Operation Nightfall, making them more determined to avoid being found by the Empire, to keep him safe from being found by either the Emperor or Vader, knowing what fate would await him if he was discovered either being killed for being the child of two Jedi, or the more likely one being he's taken to be raised and trained as a Sith, which was very possible due to him possessing a very strong and potent connection to the Force, along with having a midi-chlorian count that rivaled the Chosen One, Anakin Skywalker, or as he's now known as, Darth Vader, the one who led the attack on the Jedi Temple and helped slaughter the Jedi, even the younglings, which is the main reason they've been traversing wild space hoping they could find a planet where they could settle down and raise Naruto without worry of being hunted. Unfortunately, if there's one thing we've had to learn, not everything goes the way you hope it does, Kushina thought while leaving the cockpit and heading towards the room they set up as a makeshift nursery for Naruto, picking him up and began rocking him gently when he began crying. Sure, it's okay. It's okay. Everything will be fine. I promise. Kushina cooed, kissing him on the forehead while being unable to keep a small tremor from her voice not even believing her own words. Before she looked at her husband when he came rushing into the room, looking tense and worried, his hands twitching towards his lightsabers, with the redhead nodding in response. Yeah, I know. I'm sure Naruto even knows and can feel it, Kushina stated, making Minato frown gravely. It's him. He's managed to find us, said Minato, all of them feeling the dark presence that's quickly encroaching on them and what it meant. Vader has come. Then, I guess it's a good thing we found a planet that can hopefully hide his force signature, said Kushina, smiling weakly before the two went and placed Naruto within an escape pod, along with several things that he'll need when he's older. Neither of them was surprised that Vader's found them and was now catching up, given that they'd gone on an important mission they knew would likely put them on the Empire's radar. Once she was promoted to Jedi Knight, Kushina had been one of the few Jedi that was interested to learn where she came from and who her parents were resulting in her stumbling upon her ancestry and discovering that they had very strong ties to both the Jedi and the Sith, with it being discovered not too long ago that some artifacts relating to them were uncovered before being transported to Nar Shada to be auctioned off, leading them to make an all-or-nothing mission to recover them before the Empire could, as Kushina refused to let them pervert her ancestors' artifacts and knowledge. But like they predicted, this had gotten the Empire's attention as a result, though they had succeeded in recovering the artifacts. I just hope it was worth it to get those things for him, Minato said, placing two holocrons in the escape pod with Naruto, 
holocrons that he and Kushina made with the aid of Master Yoda after stumbling upon him on Dagobah, with them containing all their knowledge to help train him when he's older, should anything ever happen to them. They will. These will help Naruto more than anything we could teach him. He'll understand the true nature of the Force from what they can teach him, said Kushina, placing three more holocrons in the escape pod, fully believing the knowledge within them will be more than enough for their son. They also placed the materials that Naruto would need to create his own lightsaber, as well as a small turquoise crystal gem they discovered and made into a necklace for him, as well as a violet kyber crystal they found along with the artifacts, with Naruto having materials to make a second lightsaber as well. Before Kushina grabbed the last artifact they located, a mask. A mask that had become a symbol, an icon, one that helped the wearer shape history and define it by their actions. The original owner may long since be gone, but people across the galaxy would know who it belonged to the moment they saw it. The mask itself was sufficient at covering a person's head and face, being a dark gray color on the top and the narrow sides, while the rest was dark red around the eyes and down the center, while having a narrow black visor for the wearer to look through, along with a deeper vertical scratch, scarring the left side of it. Please, if you're there, help guide and protect him. He'll need you, Kushina thought, reaching out through the force and hoping her ancestors would look after Naruto for her. Placing the mask in the escape pod, Kushina and Minato looked at their son one last time before closing it. If we make it out of this, I promise we'll come for you, Naruto. We will find you, swore Kushina, hoping that they'll be able to survive, but could feel that this could be the end for them. But if we don't then live, live and grow, become better than those before you were, and never stop fighting, Minato said, wanting their son to not be like how the Jedi ultimately became, but something better than they were, to show they can be better, and to always fight for what he believes in. The two then launched the escape pod, watching as it began floating down to the planet's surface, wanting to make sure it got away. Once it was out of sight, the two rushed back to the cockpit to see just what was coming after them, arriving just in time to see an Imperial I-Class Star Destroyer come out of hyperspace. Yeah, he's on there, Kushina said, gulping a little at now feeling Vader's presence in the Force. The dark, cold feeling emanating off of him, as if you're floating through the empty darkness of space with your breath being ripped away. It really showed the difference between the Dark Jedi and Dark Side users they've encountered before, compared to a true Sith and Master of the Force. Which means that's not just a Star Destroyer, it's the Devastator, Minato stated gravely. Having heard that Vader had his personal flagship modified to have an increased amount of armaments and munition, meaning that if he really wanted to, he could simply blast them into dust, but they knew Vader wouldn't do that, knowing he'd prefer personally seeing to it any Jedi he finds are killed. The two tensed as they saw the Devastator's tractor beam shoot out and hit their ship before pulling them towards the hangar bay. Looking at each other, Minato and Kushina nodded, preparing themselves for what awaits them and what could likely be their last fight. Devastator Bridge Lord Vader, we've successfully caught the freighter in our tractor beam and are pulling it into the hangar bay, reported Captain Bolvan as he saluted Vader, while doing his best to hide his nervousness at not just being in the presence of the Dark Lord, but those who were with him. As it wasn't just Darth Vader on the bridge, but four of the Emperor's royal guards, three squads of clone stormtroopers, and two squads of death troopers, all containing five members each. The latter group was enough to set the entire crew on edge, given the nature of death troopers. But having some of the Emperor's personal guard made them all nervous, given how they existed solely for the purpose of defending the Emperor. And if any of them so much as thought someone was a threat to the Emperor's safety, no matter who they were, they wouldn't hesitate to kill them. Well done, Captain Bolvan. See to it the ship is secured for my arrival, and that no one is to enter it without my direct order, Vader ordered, with Bolvan giving a salute. At once Lord Vader. But, if I may speak freely, my lord, Bolvan said nervously knowing that Vader doesn't like it when anyone questions his orders. You may, said Vader, raising a hand to let Bolvan speak. It's just, this mission is just to eliminate two Jedi. Surely you are more than capable of dealing with them yourself, my lord. So, why is so much manpower needed to face them? Questioned Bolvan, wondering why these two Jedi required so much manpower to face when Vader has managed to hunt down and kill far more Jedi. Only for the captain to gulp when Vader turned towards him unable to ignore his fear as the Dark Lord approached and loomed over him, shivering at the sound of his mechanical breathing. These are no ordinary Jedi. One of them was once a master and hailed as one of the fastest Jedi in history, moving faster than most could even see. And the other is the last user of a style that was made specifically to combat practitioners of the dark side. You believe I alone am capable of dealing with them. I believe the Emperor should have sent more men, 
Vader said, having heard and seen for himself what Minato and Kushina were capable of, back when Anakin Skywalker still lived. He knew they weren't to be underestimated, and that anyone who does is a fool that wouldn't live long enough to make a similar mistake. The fact alone that Kushina is a master of Vopad was enough to make the Emperor ensure they were killed. Given how Mace Windu was capable of almost besting and overpowering him with his use of Vopad, pushing him into a literal corner and likely would have killed him if Vader hadn't intervened. Now, you have your orders. See that they are fulfilled, or I will find someone else to see the freighter is secured, said Vader, making Bolvan bow his head. Right away, Lord Vader, Bolvan said before quickly walking away to ensure the freighter is secured and no one goes inside without Vader's order to do so. Once the commander was out of sight, Vader turned towards the soldiers the Emperor had sent with him to ensure Minato and Kushina died. Once the freighter is secured, the Death Troopers will enter it. One squad will enter through the cargo bay, they will likely be hiding within there, waiting for a chance to strike. The second squad will enter by the boarding ramp, search all the rooms thoroughly, leave nothing to chance. Should you fail in eliminating them and they make it into the hangar, the stormtroopers will form a perimeter around the freighter. Ensure your blasters are at the ready to open fire at any sign of the Jedi leaving the freighter. Finally, the royal guard will await them in the corridor outside the hangar, as should they get past the death troopers and stormtroopers, they will doubtlessly make an attempt to destroy the devastator to take all of us down with them, Vader explained, knowing it'd be foolish to send all of them in at once. It would just be sending meat into a grinder. Not to mention how the Royal Guard and Death Troopers would do anything to complete a mission. They'd likely blast or cut down anyone that got in their way, including the Stormtroopers. So, it'd be better to have the three groups separated and work to tire out, if not eliminate, the Jedi. And should all of them fail to eliminate Minato and Kushina, then Vader himself will ensure they fall. The soldiers all stood in salute before leaving the bridge for the hangar to eliminate the Jedi fugitives, soon arriving with the Royal Guards forming up outside the entrance with the clone stormtroopers getting into position around the freighter. While the two squads of death troopers went to the cargo loading ramp and the boarding ramp, entering on opposite sides of the ship. Tossing a sonic imploder now, said one of the death troopers, their voice scrambled through the communicator so only the other death troopers understood what was said. Before they grabbed a sonic imploder and tossed it into the cargo bay of the freighter, as the squad moved to either side of the ramp, they waited until the imploder went off, unleashing high-pitched sonic waves to disorient anyone inside. Then the troopers immediately climbed on the ramp and rushed inside, holding their weapons up for any sign of movement or noise. The squad looked around the cargo bay to see if the Jedi were hiding among the containers, making sure they checked inside everything and on top of the containers. But so far, they didn't find anyone inside, before they moved further back to the engineering section of the freighter. While the other squad ran up the boarding ramp after the sonic imploder went off, ready to open fire at anything they saw, they didn't see anything so far. They moved to each of the rooms. One of the death troopers opened the door while the others were ready to shoot if the Jedi were in them, only to find the rooms were empty, making sure they thoroughly checked them. You too, check the common room. The rest of you, with me to search the cockpit, said a death trooper, pointing at two of his squad mates and towards the common room in the center of the corridors, before motioning the others to follow him to the cockpit. Nodding in response, the two death troopers moved to the back entrance of the common room, standing on either side of the door. One of the death troopers opened the door, while the second peeked inside for any sign of movement. Looking through the common room, the death trooper raised their blaster and went a step inside, only for them to suddenly be grabbed and yanked into the room, with their blaster being grabbed and slammed into their helmeted face. They only had a moment to see it was Minato, before a blue lightsaber cut off their head. One in the common room, said the death trooper moving back and quickly grabbing a C-25 fragmentation grenade. Throwing the grenade inside the common room, the trooper immediately began opening fire on Minato to keep him distracted until the grenade detonated. Minato quickly grabbed his second lightsaber and activated it, revealing it was a blue Shoto lightsaber. Acting fast, Minato grabbed the grenade with the force while deflecting the blaster bolts with his Shoto saber. Before throwing the Shoto saber at the death trooper, slicing through their blaster rifle, once that was done, Minato then tossed the grenade to the far end of the common room, jumping out just as it exploded and rocked the freighter, while the death trooper quickly pulled out their blast pistol and kept firing at the former Jedi Master, only for Minato to use the Force, enhancing his movements and reaction time, dodging the blaster bolts, before rushing forward, flipping his lightsaber into a reverse grip and slashed it at the death trooper, only for the trooper to prove to be fast as well. 
managing to pull out a vibroblade knife, blocking the lightsaber just before it could slice into them. Though they didn't get a chance to counterattack, the Shoto Saber Minato had thrown suddenly burst through their chest, before deactivating and flying back into Minato's hand, while the Death Trooper hit the ground. But the blonde Jedi didn't have a chance to relax, quickly turning around and using both his lightsabers to deflect the blaster fire from the other three Death Troopers, as they moved through the destroyed common room towards him. Grabbing a sonic imploder, one of the Death Troopers threw it at Minato and fired at the grenade when he caught it with the Force, causing the imploder to explode unleashing sonic waves right at Minato, making him cry out in pain and hold his ears from the sound. Forcing himself to move through the pain, Minato rolled out of the way of the continued blaster fire, taking cover behind an undamaged wall of the common room. Both of you, flank him, I'll cover with suppressing fire, said the death trooper as he continued firing on Minato's position, while the other two moved to surround him on either side. Once they were in position, the death troopers quickly moved in on Minato's position, only to see the door of one of the passenger cabins closing, making them move and open the door, immediately opening fire inside to take Minato out. Realizing a moment too late that the former Jedi Master wasn't in the room, and instead only seeing a large part of the wall to the captain's cabin had been ripped open, before one of the troopers gagged as a lightsaber shot out of their chest. With Minato grabbing their blast pistol and firing at the second trooper, using the body of the first as a shield against their blaster bolts. Really glad we were able to get some sonic dampeners, Minato thought, him and Kushina having put sonic dampeners in their ears, lessening the damage done by the sonic imploders. Though they still left a ringing in their ears, it wasn't bad enough to the point of being incapacitated, allowing him to still focus on the fight. Once he was sure the trooper's attention was on him, Minato ripped a metal panel off the wall of the freighter and launched it right at the trooper, with them having no time to react as the panel sliced right through their neck, separating their head from their body. Before Minato quickly ripped off a few more metal panels, using them as shields from the last Death Trooper's blaster fire, launching the metal panels at the Death Trooper, who quickly moved out of the and ducked behind a corner. Switching to their heavy blaster rifle, the Death Trooper instantly began unleashing rapid fire blaster bolts at Minato, forcing the Jedi to use both his lightsabers while enhancing his speed and reflexes to dodge and deflect the rapid fire. Meanwhile, the other squad of Death Troopers had continued moving through the cargo hold and engineering section of the freighter, not focusing on the sounds of fighting and blaster fire, knowing they're still the other Jedi and can't risk leaving themselves open for her to attack, with them missing a slight shimmer in the air of something or someone, moving on the ceiling and waiting for the right moment to strike. The moment soon coming as the Death Troopers came out of the engineering section and back into the cargo hold, before the shimmer dropped down right on top of one of the troopers, revealing Kushina wearing a stealth unit belt, the redhead having drawn her lightsaber and activated it, revealing a green blade, and swiftly decapitated the trooper she landed on, with the remaining four instantly moving back and began repeatedly firing on the former Jedi Knight. As Kushina then revealed another lightsaber blade emerging from the other end of the hilt, before she began rapidly rotating the double-sided blade around, deflecting the blaster bolts, with them hitting the walls, cargo containers, or the Death Troopers, until Kushina saw a chance and slammed her hand down on the ground, unleashing a force push that launched the Death Troopers back from her. Not stopping there, Kushina threw her lightsaber at a Death Trooper, spinning it in the air and slicing them in half at the waist, before recalling her blade. Two of the Death Troopers then pulled out frag grenades and threw them at Kushina, only for her to grab them with the force, launching them both at the third Death Trooper, sticking them to their armor before propelling the trooper outside the freighter just as the grenades exploded, before spinning her lightsaber around again as the last two death troopers began firing at her again, deflecting the blast bolts, until Kushina spun around and gave a shout, deflecting the last blast bolts right back at the troopers, which shot right through their heads, killing them. Are you alright? Minato asked, running into the cargo hold after dealing with the last death trooper, having sensed the dark side flowing through Kushina, with the redhead taking a few calming breaths. I'm fine, I just have a lot of reasons to be angry right now, replied Kushina, making the former Jedi Master nod in response, also feeling angry at what's happening and what they had to do to protect Naruto. Then it's a good thing there are still plenty of Imperials and Stormtroopers to deal with, stated Minato, both of them intending to take out everyone on the Devastator and destroy the ship itself, refusing to let anything or anyone get back to the Emperor, knowing if they did survive they couldn't risk him learning where they'd be hiding. And if they didn't survive, they wanted to make sure there's no chance he could learn about Naruto. 
Then let's take them out, Kushina said while smirking eagerly at the chance to rob Sidious of his apprentice. Grabbing some sonic imploders from the bodies of the death troopers, Minato and Kushina nodded before throwing them all outside the freighter to disorient any stormtroopers there were. Once the sonic imploders went off, the two quickly jumped out of the freighter. Seeing the clone stormtroopers were disoriented from the sonic waves, along with seeing a few were already killed from Kushina, throwing out one of the death troopers with the frag grenades. Lifting up several containers, Minato launched them at a squad of stormtroopers before rushing forward with his lightsaber and shoto saber to start cutting them down, using the force again to enhance his movement speed, making it so the troopers only saw a flash of yellow and blue before being killed. While some of the stormtroopers began regaining their senses and firing on the Jedi, with Kushina activating both sides of her lightsaber and began spinning it around, deflecting the blast bolts back at stormtroopers before lifting a few up and pulling them towards her, slashing her lightsaber across them and then throwing the bodies back at the ones that are still alive. It wasn't long before the stormtroopers lay dead, with Kushina levitating several of their bodies while Minato ripped open the hangar doors. This allowed the redhead to throw the bodies through, with the royal guards instinctively thrusting and slashing their force pikes at the projectiles. However, they soon realized the Jedi were still in the hangar. Two of the royal guards rushed forward with their force pikes, while the other two pulled out blaster pistols and began firing at Minato and Kushina. Minato charged at the royal guards coming after them, while Kushina deflected or stopped any blast bolts with the force. Once he was close enough, one of the royal guards thrust their force pike at the blonde Jedi, causing Minato to drop to the ground in a slide, only for the second royal guard to swing their force pike down at him. Minato released a concentrated force push at the ground, throwing himself into the air and above the force pike, avoiding it. He then used his momentum to get back to his feet, spinning around to slash the two royal guards. However, his attacks were blocked by their force pikes, with the one blocking his shoto saber twisting their force pike and thrusting the tip at his head. Before it could hit Minato, the royal guard was lifted into the air and cut in half by Kushina's lightsaber. The Uzumaki quickly activated the other end, blocking the second royal guard from stabbing her with a vibra sword. Minato took the chance to spin around the royal guard, stabbing his shoto saber through their back. The remaining two royal guards soon found themselves slammed against the walls, before being crushed by large containers smashing into them. Running out of the hangar bay, Minato and Kushina began making their way towards the hyperdrive engines, intent on bringing the entire ship down. They cut down any and all Imperial officers and stormtroopers they came across, knowing that if they failed to destroy the Devastator, the least they could do was take out as many Imperials as they could. But before they could reach the hyperdrive engines, the two stopped and tensed at a sudden and intense darkness washing over them, soon followed by the sound of something breathing. Hearing the sound of mechanical breathing made Minato and Kushina tense, before slowly turning around. They saw the black garbed figure of Darth Vader, the Sith Lord looking at the two former Jedi from behind his red-lensed, skull-like mask. Minato and Kushina looked at him warily, holding their lightsabers at the ready. Skywalker, you look taller. Is that the suit, or did you get new legs? Kushina said mockingly, with Vader simply walking towards them, holding his hand up slightly as his lightsaber flew into it. Anakin Skywalker is dead, just as you two will soon be, stated Vader, activating his red-bladed lightsaber. Your memory must have died with him then. We aren't easy to kill, Minato said before throwing his Shoto saber at Vader, only for it to freeze in midair before it got close. With Minato instantly charging Vader while enhancing his speed, jumping over his Shoto saber when it was launched back at him, grabbing it out of the air before blocking Vader's lightsaber swing. I have killed many Jedi. You will be no different, Vader said, before raising his hand and throwing Minato back with a force push. The former Jedi Master flipped through the air and slid across the ground. Meanwhile, Kushina took the chance and rushed the Sith Lord, dropping to the ground to avoid his lightsaber and slid past him. She jumped up back to her feet and slashed her lightsaber at his back, only for Vader to hold his hand towards her, keeping her lightsaber from hitting him. Before the redhead activated the other end of her lightsaber, twisting it around to strike him, with Vader quickly blocking it. Twisting his lightsaber and forcing Kushina's down, Vader thrust his hand forward, sending Kushina skidding back. As he went towards her, Vader began swinging his lightsaber at the Uzumaki, putting all his strength into the swings. Kushina blocked and deflected the attacks, grunting at the force behind them, until she managed to deflect Vader's lightsaber into the wall of the corridor, slicing cleanly through the metal. She then ripped a few metal panels off and threw them at Vader, 
only for the Sith Lord to raise his hand, making them freeze in the air until Minato sliced through them, bringing his lightsaber down on Vader's head. Spinning around, Vader blocked the overhead strike, with Minato then swinging his Shoto saber at his chest, which Vader stopped with the force. However, Vader grunted when Kushina slashed him across his back, cutting through his cape and armor. You never were good at watching your back, Kushina said tauntingly, only to grunt when Vader unleashed a blast of the force, throwing her and Minato to opposite ends of the corridor. And you never did learn to stay silent in battle, Vader said before lifting up several objects in the hallway and began launching them at Minato and Kushina. Seeing the projectiles coming towards them, Minato and Kushina acted quickly and began slicing through them with their lightsabers or throwing them aside with the force. However, they soon found themselves ripped from the ground and pulled towards Vader, who held his lightsaber up to finish them. But before they got close to the Dark Lord, Kushina managed to rip a few panels off the wall and launch them at Vader, forcing him to slice through them with his lightsaber. This helped break his concentration enough to let Mina toe flip around in the air to deliver a slash at Vader. The Sith Lord blocked the slash before sidestepping Kushina's attempt to slash him across the back again. Vader grabbed hold of Kushina with the force and threw her into Minato, sending them flying down the corridor. Not stopping there, Vader ripped a metal panel off the floor before slicing it in half and launching both halves at Minato and Kushina. Acting fast, Minato pushed Kushina out of the way, stopping the metal fragments from hitting him with the force, only to end up grunting when Vader ripped off a wall panel behind him that cut into his side. Scowling, Kushina grabbed hold of one of the metal containers behind Vader, yanking it towards him. Vader held his hand towards it, stopping the container from hitting him before throwing it towards Kushina. She cut it in half and threw her lightsaber at Vader, spinning it in the air to cut him down. But once again, Vader stopped the lightsaber before raising his own as Minato rushed him at high speed, swinging his Shoto saber at the Dark Lord. Vader tried launching Minato back, only for the blonde Jedi to hold his own hand out to throw Vader back. Before Vader had Kushina's lightsaber, come towards them to stab Minato in the back, only for Kushina to hold her hand out and stop it. However, this was what Vader wanted, as he then instantly launched the lightsaber back at the former Jedi Knight. Kushina's eyes widened before she quickly bent backwards, avoiding being stabbed by her own lightsaber, and holding her hand out to freeze it when Vader tried rotating it to cut her in half. Deactivating her lightsaber, Kushina grabbed it and rushed at Vader and her husband while Minato managed to deflect Vader's lightsaber away and flip over him, activating his lightsaber to stab him. But Vader turned faster than they expected, blocking Minato's stab and pushing his lightsaber to the side, before stopping him from activating his Shoto saber. Then faster than either expected, Vader's hand shot up and wrapped around Minato's throat. He threw Minato towards Kushina, just as she was about to bring her lightsaber down on him, paling a little that she was about to nearly kill her husband. Kushina instantly deactivated her lightsaber, only to cry out when Vader threw his lightsaber at her, cutting her across her arm, before he went to direct his lightsaber to slice through her body, only for Minato to block it by throwing his Shoto saber into the air, knocking Vader's lightsaber away. Gritting her teeth, Kushina managed to focus enough and launched the Shoto saber straight at Vader, though the Sith Lord recalled his lightsaber and swung it, knocking aside the Shoto saber, before he was suddenly pushed back when Minato slammed his lightsaber hilt into the panel on his chest. Vader gasped at the hit, his breathing growing heavier as Minato slammed his lightsaber into the panel a few more times until the lights on it went out. Kushina took the chance to launch the scattered metal containers at Vader, pushing him back as he tried focusing on deflecting or slicing through them. However, he had trouble focusing as his suit malfunctioned from the damage, depriving him of oxygen. Vader grunted as a container struck him in the face, feeling one of the lenses of his mask crack. He was then sent skidding down the corridor for Minato's force push. And here I thought you were just a machine, Kushina stated as they heard Vader's labored breathing. Before he then looked up, showing the broken lens pieces falling off the mask, revealing his yellow, red-rimmed eye. I grow tired of these games, said Vader, before thrusting his hand forward, launching Minato and Kushina back, sending them crashing into the far wall. The impact made them gasp in pain before quickly getting to their feet as Vader approached them. Moving his hand, Vader ripped apart the walls and floor, tearing away pieces of jagged metal and launched them at the Jedi. Activating her lightsaber, Kushina began spinning it around, slicing through the projectiles, while Minato ripped away two metal panels from the wall, using them as shields against the metal fragments, 
before running beside the wall towards Vader. Once he was close enough, Minato launched the panels at Vader, only for the Dark Lord to slash through them and thrust his hand towards Minato, sending him crashing against the wall. Vader swung his lightsaber at the pinned Minato, though he managed to move his arm and block it with his own lightsaber. Seeing her husband pinned down, Kushina dispersed the metal fragments that Vader kept launching and rushed forward. But before she could reach them, she grunted in pain when a metal fragment rose up and stabbed her through her leg, followed by a metal container slamming into the back of her head, sending Kushina to the floor as her vision spun from the blow. While Minato gritted his teeth as Vader put all his strength into pushing his lightsaber down onto him, along with keeping him pinned against the wall with the Force. The blonde Jedi glanced around for anything he could use to distract the Sith long enough to get free, before he spotted his Shoto saber where Vader threw it. Knowing it'd be risky and close, Minato began focusing on moving the Shoto saber into position, biting back a scream of pain as Vader's lightsaber got close enough to start burning him. Luckily, though, the Shoto saber was soon in position and aimed at Vader. Now, Minato thought, calling on the Force and having the Shoto saber shoot through the air straight into Vader's back while he was focused. Unfortunately, right as Minato had the Shoto saber activate to impale Vader, the Sith Lord threw his hand back, stopping it in midair. His eyes widened in fear when Vader then launched the Shoto saber towards the still-dazed Kushina. Kushina! Minato yelled, hoping to snap her out of her daze, before forcing his hand off the wall and towards the Shoto saber, relieved that he managed to stop it before it hit her. Only for this moment to cost him, as Vader pulled his lightsaber back before bringing it down, shattering the blade of Minato's lightsaber to leave a deep, diagonal slash across his chest. No! Screamed Kushina in grief and horror as Minato's body fell to the ground, while Vader turned towards her. Do not despair. You will be joining him soon enough, Vader said, moving towards the redhead. With his words making Kushina glare at him in pure rage before she shouted, unleashing a powerful blast of the force that bent and twisted the metal corridor, damaging it even further, along with crushing the scattered containers and metal fragments. Before she focused it all on Vader, throwing him against the wall, making him grunt at the impact while feeling his suit take further damage. Until Kushina got up and thrust her hand towards him, pushing Vader further into the wall before it finally broke, sending the Sith Lord flying into another hallway. This got the attention of some stormtroopers, making them rush forward to their commander, only to be cut down from Kushina's lightsaber flying through the air, with the weapon then flying back into her hand, while Vader got up to one knee, raising his lightsaber in time to block Kushina's strike. Looking at the enraged Uzumaki, Vader could sense the dark side building within her. Yes, use your anger, let it fuel you, said Vader while standing up as their lightsabers clashed against each other until Kushina forced his off to the side and flipped hers around activating the other end. Shut up, Kushina yelled, swinging the other end of her lightsaber up, slicing Vader across his side, before he pushed her off to the side. Such hatred, such power. It's only a shame you did not use it earlier. Perhaps Minato might still be alive if you did, Vader said, angering Kushina further at him saying her husband's name. Launching herself at Vader, Kushina began rapidly swinging her lightsaber at him, with Vader walking back while blocking each of her strikes. Before Vader blocked her lightsaber and deflected it into the wall, cutting through it, the Dark Lord then sidestepped Kushina, moving his hand and sending her flying down the hallway into the wall. Do you have nothing more to say? I always believed you enjoy talking taunting your enemies? Or did your humor die with your husband? Said Vader insultingly, making Kushina glare at him murderously, only to soon smirk wickedly. Did yours die with Padme? Kushina asked, causing Vader to freeze while feeling his rage building. What did you just say? Vader demanded lowly, while Kushina got back up while smirking tauntingly at him. What's the matter? Did I strike a nerve? Don't you like hearing her name? You two were in a relationship after all said Kushina mockingly, with the Dark Lord's visible eye began glowing as the dark side swirled around him. Yes, yeah, surprised. You shouldn't be. You two weren't. Exactly subtle when you were around each other. It wasn't that hard for me and Minato to figure it out. Hell, I'm sure others noticed, but either chose to ignore it or refused to believe the Great Chosen One would break the Jedi Code. I wouldn't even be surprised if Obi-Wan knew the truth. He was the one with the brains after all, and clearly the better fighter. Kushina taunted only for the dark side to erupt off of Vader. Silence! roared Vader, unleashing a force blast of pure dark side energy towards Kushina, 
tearing apart the hallway as it went towards her. Kushina held her hands out, creating a force barrier to block the blast, managing to block most of the damage, but still found herself thrown through the air and through the wall. Grunting as she got up, Kushina idly thrust her hand towards some Imperial officers, sending them crashing into the wall hard enough to break their necks. Before quickly holding her lightsaber up, when Vader rushed at her far faster than she thought he could move, bringing his lightsaber down on her, the former Jedi Knight gritted her teeth as he slammed his lightsaber down on hers with overwhelming strength. Though just as Vader brought his lightsaber down again to break through Kushina's defenses, Minato's Shoto saber suddenly came flying from behind him, slicing right through his prosthetic right arm. The sudden loss of his arm was enough to stun Vader, giving Kushina the chance to get up, grabbing the Shoto saber as it flew into her hand. Kushina then began swinging both lightsabers at Vader, forcing the Sith Lord back, unable to block with his lightsaber still held in his severed hand. You want anger? Hate? Power? Then here, Kushina said, thrusting her hand forward, sending Vader skidding back across the floor before throwing the Shoto saber at him. Vader managed to call the weapon to him in time to block Kushina's follow-up strike, only to drop it when she quickly flipped her lightsaber around to try and cut off his other hand. The Dark Lord quickly dropped the Shoto Saber and propelled towards the Redhead, making Kushina grunt as it sliced into her side, forcing her to jump back and stopping her from removing Vader's other arm. Before the former Jedi Knight quickly backflipped in the air, dodging Vader's lightsaber as he summoned it back to him, then charged at Kushina again, swinging his blade to remove her head, only for the Uzumaki to raise her lightsaber and block the attack, with the two glaring at each other. It's truly a shame you must die. You would have made a fine apprentice, Vader stated, feeling a little regret he has to kill Kushina, as with the power she possessed, she'd have made a powerful Sith apprentice to help overthrow the Emperor. Yet I was stronger long before you ever became a knight. And I'm still stronger, retorted Kushina, before ripping off a large part of the wall and slamming it into Vader, sending him crashing into the corridor. Vader blasted the piece of wall apart, only to be pushed back when Kushina slashed her lightsaber across his chest feeling it actually cut into his flesh along with his suit. The Sith Lord though managed to raise his hand, blocking her next strike to try and remove his head, only for Kushina to spin around, swinging her lightsaber up and slashing him right across his mask and helmet. Come on, Skywalker. I want to watch you die. Kushina said, eager to see the life leave his eyes before swinging her lightsaber again, only for Vader to raise his hand, freezing it in place as he slowly lifted his head showing a long diagonal cut through his mask, revealing his scarred and pale flesh, along with both his eyes being exposed now. The only one that will die is you, Jedi, said Vader, with the damage to his respirator making his voice glitch and be filled with static, twisting it between his voice and Anakin's. As long as you die too, hissed Kushina, thrusting her hand forward, only for Vader to meet it with a force push of his own. Before he pushed forward, sending Kushina skidding back, only to be on her in an instant, swinging his lightsaber, slicing Kushina across her abdomen. The redhead grit her teeth in pain at the strike, managing to block his lightsaber from cutting her any deeper than he already did, with her then thrusting her hand forward to push him back, only to be surprised when lightning shot out of her hand and impacted Vader, making the Sith Lord grunt in pain as he was thrown back, while feeling his suit's power fading from the surprising force lightning. While Kushina looked at her hand in surprise, she soon smiled darkly as it sparked with lightning, unaware that her eyes were beginning to turn yellow with a red rim around her pupil. I'm starting to see why you chose the dark side. This power is fun, said Kushina before holding her hand out, firing another blast of force lightning. However, Vader was prepared and blocked it with his lightsaber. Power that is unrefined, untrained, and weak, Vader said as he stood up, swinging his lightsaber to deflect the force lightning. Then he held out his hand causing Kushina to clutch her throat as he choked her. Witness the true power of the dark side, said Vader before thrusting his hand forward, propelling Kushina down the corridor where she slammed into the wall, knocking the wind out of her. Vader then threw his lightsaber straight at Kushina. She barely managed to move her head to avoid it hitting her, then ducked down and rolled under it as Vader moved it across the wall to decapitate her. The Dark Lord then recalled it to his hand, all the while approaching Kushina, tearing wall panels off and launching them at her. Swinging her lightsaber, Kushina sliced through the panels as they were launched at her, then held her hand out, causing the Shoto saber to come flying at Vader again. However, the Sith Lord stopped it this time before it could remove another of his limbs, 
then raised his lightsaber and blocked Kushina's strike when she closed the distance between them. Kushina didn't stop there. She spun around, flipping her lightsaber and slashing Vader across his left arm, damaging the prosthetic limb. While Vader managed to stop her from slicing all the way through it, he launched her back again, sending the Shoto Saber flying after her. Kushina gasped in pain before gritting her teeth when the Shoto Saber stabbed through the left side of her abdomen. Glaring at the Sith Lord, Kushina's hands sparked with lightning again before she fired bolts of lightning at Vader. He deflected them again with his lightsaber, but Kushina kept firing lightning at him, forcing Vader to keep his lightsaber up and block it, knowing the likely chance it could kill him if he was hit by too much of it. This allowed Kushina to get back to her feet before she began approaching Vader, tearing off parts of the walls and throwing them at him. She forced Vader to not only block the force lightning, but deflect the wall fragments from slamming into him. But as he was focused on the lightning and wall fragments, Kushina then took the chance to strike. Shouting, Kushina slammed her hand down on the ground, causing it to start splitting open beneath Vader. Then she lifted her hand, making the floor quickly rise up, sending Vader crashing into the ceiling. The former Jedi Knight rushed forward, swinging her lightsaber to finish Vader off. However, Vader was able to use the Force to move his body enough to avoid a lethal strike, though Kushina still succeeded in cutting off his left prosthetic leg, sending Vader falling to the ground. Not stopping there, Kushina thrust her hand forward, sending Vader flying back and crashing into a wall, before she began launching all the debris around her at him, smirking wickedly as it all slammed into him, until Vader let out a shout releasing a force blast that destroyed all the debris and sent Kushina crashing back through a wall and into a room. Gritting her teeth, Kushina struggled to stand up, feeling the impact only further aggravated her wounds, along with feeling a few bones were likely cracked. Though when she saw Vader getting up, using the force to grab his severed leg and keep it in place to stand up, the redhead pushed past her pain and got up, before charging Vader. The Sith Lord doing the same though unable to move very fast due to needing to keep his severed leg in place. With Kushina reaching Vader first and jumping up into the air and bringing her lightsaber down on him, while Vader raised his lightsaber blocking her strike. A blast of the force being released from the collision, as the two put all the anger, hate, and fury into the strike to overpower the other. Before Kushina shouted and pushed Vader's severed leg out from under him, knocking him off balance and allowing her blade to cut right through his armor and torso. Only for the former Jedi Knight to gasp in pain as her eyes widened, Vader having taken to slice his own blade across her chest. Neither of the wounds being deep enough to be fatal, but enough to knock both Force users back. Kushina being the first to get up and glared at Vader, before slowly approaching to finish him for good. With the Sith Lord merely looking up at her, dark enjoyment shining in his eyes. The Emperor will be pleased to have such a powerful apprentice, said Vader, knowing that if she strikes him down, she'll merely take his place as Sidious's apprentice, only for Kushina to scoff. After you, he's next, and I'll enjoy killing him even more, Kushina said with a dark grin before raising her lightsaber up to remove his head. But just before Kushina could bring her lightsaber down, she felt a cry rip through the force, making her gasp as she was snapped out of her rage-induced state. Naruto? Kushina thought, recognizing her son's cry, making her worry that something happened to him only for realization to dawn on her that he must have somehow been watching the fight through the Force and saw what she was doing. The Uzumaki then gasped in pain as Vader took her moment of hesitation, summoning the Shoto Saber from behind her and stabbed it right through Kushina's chest, before the Sith Lord swung his lightsaber across her chest, ensuring that she died. With the strike knocking Kushina back, gasping in pain, yet still felt relief. Thank you, Naruto. Thought Kushina, Thankful her son was able to pull her away from the dark side, letting her die as a Jedi rather than live as a Sith. Once he sensed Kushina's life fade away, Vader collapsed against the wall, finding it harder to breathe as he stopped using the Force to keep his body going. Along with seeing the extent of the damage done to him, aside from the obvious loss of his arm and leg, as well as his mask and helmet being damaged, he saw his armor was in tatters, the control panel on his chest being little more than scrap metal his remaining cybernetics being damaged and exposed. Being able to feel the synthetic internal organs would likely need to be replaced thanks to the Force Lightning. And what little part of him that's still human was just as broken as his mechanical parts. Gritting his teeth, Vader called on his severed leg and forcefully welded it back into place, knowing it'll just be another thing that'll need to be replaced. Before forcing himself to stand up, 
doing so with some difficulty and needing to call on the force to move his body, channeling his pain and agony into anger and hatred, fueling the dark side while keeping him alive. Before his attention turned towards the sound of footsteps, making Vader glare at the sight of some Imperial officers, including Captain Bolvan, only for them to stop at his glare and the state the Sith Lord was in, none of them having ever seen Vader like this before. Go prepare a Bacta tank now, ordered Vader, needing to get out this suit and have the remaining limbs removed so he can rest and heal. Yes, Lord Vader, Bolvan said after snapping out of his shock and saluting, before directing some of the officers to go prepare a Bacta tank, with Vader leaning against the wall and began limping his way towards the medical bay, no one daring to risk trying to assist him on the chance it'd only further anger him. Though without warning, Vader stopped and turned towards the room he launched Kushina into, before making his way towards it. While the Imperial officer only looked on in confusion, none of them sure what exactly he was doing, until Vader reached the room, finding it was a viewing port and looked out the window into space, narrowing his eyes at the sight of the shattered moon orbiting the planet they were over. That wasn't what had his attention though, the Dark Lord instead having heard something from the Force, as if something or someone had just cried out. Where was it? Vader thought, only to watch as his reflection began changing, until he was now looking at the sight of a crying infant. The sight surprising Vader, even more so when the infant stopped crying and actually seemed to look right at him, as Vader felt everything else around him fade away, leaving only him and the infant looking at each other, now as if they were right in front of each other. Are you? thought Vader, reaching out towards the infant to grab him. Lord Vader? Is something wrong? Is something out there? Unquestioned Imperial officer nervously, forcing themselves to approach the Dark Lord for his strange actions. With this making Vader look at them before looking back at the window, only to once again see his own reflection and no sign of the infant. Where are you? Vader thought narrowing his eyes wondering if the clearly Force-sensitive infant was on the planet. But when he tried searching for where they were, Vader found that he could barely sense anything on the planet, let alone any Force signatures powerful enough to reach out to him, feeling he sensed something, only for it to soon vanish as if it was never there at all. It's nothing. Nothing is out there, Vader said, believing the battle he just had was also messing with his senses, that he was just seeing and sensing things now. Before he turned away from the window, only to stop and look back out at the planet before shaking his head as he looked away, knowing he didn't have time to start imagining things. All the while Vader and the infant he saw were both unaware of what just happened, of the bond that's now been unknowingly forged between them, neither being aware of what else occurred this day, nor the consequences that'll come from it. With Naruto. Meanwhile, Naruto's escape pod had entered the atmosphere of the planet, flying down towards one of the continents until finally crashing down in the middle of a field. With the sudden appearance of the flying object coming down from the sky getting the attention of a few people, even more so at seeing where it was heading. With one person in particular heading towards it to investigate what had crash-landed. The person was a slender yet shapely fair-skinned woman with waist-length purple hair with shorter bangs that is in a heim cut and brownish eyes. She wore the traditional attire of a miko that is a purple hakama, a white haori with a sash-like belt, wooden sandals, and a white ribbon to partially hold her hair in place with her also carrying a wooden bakken. The woman looked at the metal object in surprise at the sight of it, before she began approaching it. Is it some new Atlas drone? The woman wondered, before tensing and stepping back when the object hissed and released some steam, with it then opening up, shocking the woman when she saw what was inside. Seeing it was a sleeping baby wrapped in a blanket, with wisps of spiky blonde hair, pale fair skin, and three unique whisker-like marks on his cheeks while also seeing several objects were in the pod with him, including three blue, glowing, crystal-like cubes, a red pyramid-shaped crystal, with all of them having a few metal pieces attached, several mechanical parts that looked like they'd fit together, a violet-colored crystal, a small turquoise crystal on a necklace, and the last object was a gray and red mask with a thin black visor. Picking up the infant, the woman rocked him a few times when he began squirming, before grabbing the mask and looking it over in confusion momentarily looking up at the sky in wonderment, before then smiling at the baby. You must have come a long way from home, didn't you little one? The woman stated, causing the baby's eyes to flutter open, revealing they were a bluish-gray color. I'm not really sure where you came from, but it seems like you're alone here. So, what do you think of coming home with me? Would you like that? Asked the woman, with the baby looking at her for a few moments before smiling and giggling, making the woman's smile grow. I'll take that as a yes. 
In that case, I'm Mia Asama and I'll be your mama from now on, alright? Mia said before frowning she realized she didn't know his name, until she noticed some stitching on the blanket. Naruto Uzumaki. That's a cute name for an equally cute baby. Naruto Uzumaki Asama, said Mia, smiling at Naruto who'd fallen back asleep. Mia then gathered up everything that was inside the pod with Naruto, figuring that whoever put them there with him, likely his birth parents if they're the ones who sent him here, so she wanted to make sure nothing was left behind for him when he's older. Once she got everything, Mia turned to head back to her inn, only to pause and look around with a serene smile, though soon a dark aura surrounding her as a Hanya mask appeared above her. I don't know who you are or where you're hiding, but it's really not nice to spy on a new mother with her son. Please refrain from doing so in the future, Mia said to seemingly no one, before taking her leave. All the while a raven bird watched her leave in shock, not believing that she was somehow able to tell she was here. Before the raven narrowed its eyes at the pod, highly doubting that it could have come from anywhere in the Four Kingdoms, maybe not even all of Remnant. Something that intrigued the raven, at the chance it could have come from beyond Remnant. The fact that it had someone, a baby inside of it, only further intrigued the raven. Before the bird flew off, though made a mental note to keep an eye on this strange new visitor, all while feeling that things have suddenly begun shifting for all of them. And whether it was good or bad, the raven felt that everything she knew was about to change. The moment the shield came down, he had green squadron land and begin marching towards the Separatist's base. Feeling the dark side flowing through him from the rage and hate, he felt at the earlier humiliation due to Roan's incompetence in the initial attack. Though just before they reached the city, he raised hands stopping the stormtroopers from continuing onward due to seeing Hawk battling the Separatist commander, another clone, both of them fighting each other with nothing but their fists. It made him curious enough to hold off and attacking to see what the end result would be if Hawk would win or even be able to bring himself to kill one of his brothers. It seemed like Hawk was going to lose when he was knocked to. The ground and the rebel clone aimed a blaster at his head, only for Hawk to manage to grab a large rock and quickly swing it around, striking the clone's face hard enough that he could hear his neck snap. Finish them. He ordered the stormtroopers, with all of them immediately opening fire on the separatists as they began retreating at the death of their commander. While his men shot down the fleeing rebels, he stepped towards Hawk and, doing something he thought he was incapable of doing any longer, offered him a hand up, something that even surprised Hawk, before he reached out and took his hand. You have done well, Commander, he said, pleased not only with proving his loyalty to the Empire, but also in ensuring they would wipe out the last of the Separatists. Thank you, sir. But the battle's not over yet, said Hawk, grabbing the dead clone's blaster for himself. No, it's not he stated before igniting his lightsaber and giving himself over to the dark side, holding out his hand and lifting three rebels into the air before snapping their necks. He then charged into the fray of the battle, swinging his crimson blade at every rebel he reached, slicing through them with ease, or reaching out and grabbing them with the force, sending them crashing into walls, breaking their bones, or splitting their heads open, along with pulling them closer and cutting them into pieces with his lightsaber. While around him, the stormtroopers shot them down no matter what they did. Whether they ran, hid, or even tried surrendering, all of them were killed. Seeing that even Hawk wasn't hesitating in killing anyone he saw, the clone grabbing someone by their throat before throwing them to the side. But with each rebel he killed, he felt his wrath grow even further. The anger, rage, and hate were welcomed as the dark side flowed through him, reaching out and pulling a rebel into his hand, lifting them into the air as he personally choked the life out of them with his lightsaber swinging around, killing anyone foolish enough to try attacking him. More, 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 more. He needed more death, more pain, more screams. He wanted to see every last one of them begging for mercy before ending their worthless lives. But why was he enjoying this? Why was he enjoying killing people that were running away, that were begging for mercy, that were surrendering? Because they're the enemy. Fools that dared to believe they could challenge the empire and would receive nothing but destruction. Even when the rebel soldiers were dead, leaving nothing but defenseless civilians, he didn't stop. He refused to stop. Seeing them dare to pick up anything that could be a weapon, that even now they still try to resist. He felt himself begin growling before lifting his lightsaber up and bringing it down on the civilians, killing every one of them he could. It didn't matter who they were and he didn't care. Men, women, and children all fell at his feet and he relished in it as the dark side seemed to swirl around him, delighted at the ruthlessness. Why was he doing this? Why couldn't he stop? He didn't want to stop, 
He had no reason to. Why would he even want to? His lightsaber left a crimson trail as he slashed another rebel in half, before grabbing another by their head and slamming them into the ground. Their head exploding into blood, bone, and gray matter, stained his clawed hand red. Before his head snapped towards the sound of whimpering, seeing a child standing amongst the bodies, growling at the sight of someone surviving, he stalked forward and hovered over the terrified child, relishing in the fear and dread he could sense within him. Before he roared loudly and swung his blade, slicing straight through the child's neck, sending their head flying away from their body. Stop. But he didn't want to stop. He couldn't. He couldn't control his body. No matter how hard he tried, he kept moving and killing more people. Even when he tried shouting, begging to stop, his body kept moving. He couldn't even speak. And there was nothing to say. He had no reason to waste words on insects that only deserved to be crushed beneath his boot. He then made his way into the Separatist's base, catching a glimpse of his own reflection, the glowing red and yellow eyes behind blood-red lenses, and the skeletal mask dripping with blood, until it split open, revealing razor-sharp teeth that hungered for blood. His body seemed to have grown, splitting open his suit, revealing black, smoky fur, and metallic limbs with white bone armor over his body, along with metallic claws covered in blood, and his red lightsaber in his hand humming eagerly to continue the slaughter, to make sure nothing leaves here alive. Entering the base, he ripped, slashed, and slaughtered anyone he came across, uncaring who they were, only that they were in his way. Until soon he found the three separatist leaders, which only fueled his wrath and anger further that they were nothing but old and decrepit fools. He didn't need to kill them, they weren't even drawing their weapons. They weren't going to fight or try stopping me, they could be taken prisoner instead. No. That would only be a weakness, to let them live after they refused to bow down in the first place. Now they will all pay in blood. He didn't hesitate and lunged forward, grabbing the old woman by her throat, roaring loudly in her face, before squeezing his fist tightly enough to crush her neck. Then he turned and swung his lightsaber, nearly bisecting the second rebel leader, with blood splattering across the walls and floor. Before he lifted the final one into the air with the force, slamming them into the ceiling then into the floor doing this a few more times, before finishing it by slamming his head against the table, splitting it open and making blood pour out over it, leaving the body slumped over the table. But he wasn't done yet, he could still sense more rebels inside the base and he still wasn't satisfied, he needed more blood and destruction, continuing through the base and killing anyone else still alive. It wasn't long before he arrived at what looked to be a medical bay, filled with injured and crippled soldiers, none of whom looked like they'd even be able to stand, let alone fight. He'll savor their pain the most. Though before he could decide who to kill first, Hawk ran past him, making him pause and look at the clone, wondering if he wanted to kill them instead. Your leaders are dead. Take a knee and bow to your new lord, Hawk said while holding his arm out towards him. Then follow your leaders into oblivion, he roared, raising his lightsaber and swinging it at the first fool who dared to stand up, slashing his body in half diagonally, before he began slaughtering the rest. No. 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 Stop it. Stop. Stop. Naruto shot up in his bed, screaming in panic and fear, looking down at himself in terror at what he'd see, only calming down a little to see his normal body. No claws, no black fur, no metal limbs, and no blood. Before he flinched when the door slammed open and Mia ran in with her sword, looking around in worry, before settling on her five-year-old son. Naruto, are you all right? Are you hurt? Did something happen? Mia asked, rushing over to him in concern, having quickly run to his room after hearing him scream, terrified that something happened. I'm Finemom. Just, just a, a nightmare. A terrible nightmare, said Naruto, feeling shaken at just how real it all felt, with Mia hugging him close and rubbing his back comfortingly. It's okay. It's okay. Anything you saw can't hurt you. You're safe. I promise, Mia said comfortingly only to look at the whiskered blonde in confusion when he shook his head. No. I wasn't the one hurt. I was the one hurting people. Killing them. I, I was, Naruto said, looking at his hands in horror at how he could do any of that. Wait, wait, calm down. What do you mean you were the one hurting people? Questioned Mia, concerned at just what kind of nightmare he'd have where he's hurting and killing people. I, I don't know. Just felt that, it was me, I was, I was seeing everything happening like I was really there. I was in a battle, flying in the air and, and shooting at a shield, 
like it was made from hard light dust, until it went down, and then there were two guys that looked the same fighting each other, before one killed the other. I, I offered him a hand up, and then, then we, we began killing, everyone. They were, they were rebels, but, they were running away, but I didn't care, I just wanted to kill them all. Even the civilians, the women and children, I didn't care. I just wanted them dead. Then I, I killed the leaders. And, and I liked it, and even, the people who were injured and couldn't fight, I killed them too because, because they wouldn't bow, said Naruto, shaking at remembering everything he saw and did, with Mia hugging him tightly and placing a kiss on top of his head. No matter what you saw, you would never do anything like that, Naruto. You would never hurt an innocent person, let alone enjoy hurting or killing anyone, Mia said as Naruto returned the hug, calming down a little. It, it still felt real, that even if I didn't do it, it still happened, somewhere. And, and I remember things, words I've never heard before. I, remember something called a, lightsaber. It looked like a sword made of light, like hard light dust, only it seemed really hot. And the force, that could let you move things. What, what does that mean? Naruto asked while looking at his mother, hopeful that she could help him understand the nightmare and these strange things he somehow remembered, despite never even hearing about them before. While the purplet couldn't help but frown at this, not only at how lifelike and real Naruto's nightmare had been, that he believed it actually happened somewhere, but also at the words he now seemed to know, lightsaber and the force. Just the way he mentioned them seemed like he should have some understanding of what they were. Before Mia sighed, realizing that it's likely time to tell her son where he came from. Naruto, you know how I told you that you were adopted, but that still doesn't change the fact that I love you, said Mia, making the Uzumaki-sama look at her in confusion. Yeah, Naruto said, having known that he was adopted, but that didn't stop him from loving Mia any less and seeing her as his mother, regardless of whether they're related or not. Well, I didn't tell you the full truth. Come with me, Mia said, getting up and motioning Naruto to follow her, further confusing Naruto but followed after her. Mia led Naruto back to her room, motioning him to sit on the bed before going over to her closet. Opening it up, Mia pushed aside the clothes hanging inside, opening up a secret compartment in the back, big enough to store a box inside, with such a box being kept there. Grabbing it, Mia went over and sat beside Naruto, handing him the box. When I found you, I also found all of these items, Mia said, with Naruto opening the box only to be confused at what he saw inside. Seeing a mask, Strange crystal objects that glowed blue, aside from one that was pyramid-shaped and glowing red, a necklace with a turquoise crystal gem, a violet crystal, and several metal pieces. When you found me? And what is this stuff? Naruto asked, grabbing one of the cube-shaped crystals, looking at it in fascination. Yes. You see, the night I found you, something fell out of the sky and crash-landed not far from here, so I went to investigate it. But when I arrived, it wasn't a meteor or anything else I thought it could be. Instead it was a metal pod, and there you were inside it, revealed Mia, much to the whiskered blonde's shock as he looked at her. Are you saying, I'm not, from Remnant? said Naruto in disbelief, realizing that he isn't from Remnant at all, with Mia nodding in response. That's really the only explanation I could think of, for how you showed up with these strange objects, and now your nightmare that you believe really happened somewhere. While I don't know how or exactly why you were sent to Remnant, just that it seemed you were sent here with these items to help you learn where you came from, Mia explained. Naruto looked back at the items in disbelief, before feeling something telling him to grab another one of the cube crystals, making him look at the two in wonderment, as if they were really important. He yelped when they suddenly began glowing, with the corners rotating before flying off. The mother-son duo watched in amazement as the cubes floated in the air, before two holograms appeared in front of them, one of a man and the other a woman. Naruto, said the woman, smiling lovingly at Naruto, surprising him that she knew his name. You, know my name, Naruto said, with the two smiling at him. Of course we know your name, we're the ones who gave it to you, the man stated in amusement, making Naruto look at them with wide eyes. That, does that mean, you two are, my parents? My birth parents? Naruto asked. Yes, yes we're your parents. I'm your mother, Kushina Uzumaki. And the flaky looking one is your father, Minato Namikaze. Kushina said while smirking at her husband. Still going on with that, huh? muttered Minato, while Naruto still looked at them in shock. Then, why did you send me away? Why aren't you here? demanded Naruto, wanting to know why they'd send him away if they seemed happy to see him. With Minato and Kushina both looking saddened, already knowing what it meant if he's looking at their holocrons, 
what it meant for them. Naruto, believe us when we say, the only reason we would have sent you away is to keep you safe, to send you to a planet where you wouldn't be found. Otherwise, if we could, we'd never have wanted to leave you. But, Kushina said sadly, but if you're looking at our holocrons, it means that we're dead. And these holocrons were created by us for you. Should that ever happen? They contain all our knowledge, so that you can learn everything we did and know why it is we had to send you away for your own safety, Minato said, with Kushina nodding in agreement. So, you sent me away to keep me safe, said Naruto, saddened to know that his birth parents are actually dead, but glad they didn't send him away because they didn't want him. Of course, we'd never send you away if it wasn't for your own good. The day we learned I was pregnant was the happiest in our lives, that we'd finally be able to have a family, to be able to find a place where we could settle down and live in peace, where you'd be able to grow up and have a normal, happy life. That's what we wanted for you, Kushina said assuredly. Then why? What happened? Questioned Naruto, wanting to know what danger there was that'd make them send him away to another planet. To try and keep things short, your mother and I were once part of a group called the Jedi Order an order that was originally meant to be peacekeepers throughout the known galaxy, but over time they lost sight of their original purpose and became servants to the Galactic Republic, said Minato. Don't try and sugarcoat it, the Jedi were the Republic's attack dogs and we both know it, Kushina said, making Minato sigh but nod in agreement, knowing she's right. She's right again. But the Jedi were destroyed, and it honestly started years ago before you were born when we were dragged into a galactic war called the Clone Wars between the Galactic Republic and the Confederacy of Independent Systems, or the Separatists as they're otherwise known as, a confederate of star systems that wanted to break away from the Republic due to the corruption within it. While the Separatists fought using an army of droids, the Republic fought using a clone army created from the DNA of Jango Fett, a Mandalorian bounty hunter that was considered the greatest in the galaxy, with the Jedi becoming the generals and commanders of the army. We learned too late the Clone Wars had been orchestrated by the Grand Chancellor of the Republic, Chief Palpatine who was really the Dark Lord of the Sith, Darth Sidious, Minato explained with a frown, while Naruto couldn't help but gulp at the name Sidious. It was Sidious's plan to destroy the Jedi and overthrow the Republic from within. With the clones having been programmed with a command called Order 66, on paper, it was meant to be a contingency for Jedi who had gone rogue. When in actuality it was meant to eliminate the Jedi by turning our own army against us, with hundreds of Jedi being killed when it was activated, as well as being betrayed by one of our own, Anakin Skywalker, who became Sidious's Sith apprentice, Darth Vader. He personally lead the attack on the Jedi Temple, killing all those within, with the Galactic Republic dissolved and turned into the Galactic Empire with Sidious and Vader in control. A few Jedi like Minato and I managed to escape being killed as we were always suspicious about the creation of the clone army without the Jedi's knowledge, leading to us never taking command of any clones, said Kushina. But, even if we escaped, we were labeled as fugitives of the Empire and constantly hunted, forcing us to stay on the move. Though after you were born, we didn't want to take any chances and created these holocrons with the aid of the Jedi Grand Master, Yoda, after stumbling upon where he went into self-exile to make sure you'd know us and learn everything we did, should anything happen. And it seems like we did the right thing, Minato said, with the whiskered blonde frowning and looking down. Then, this Vader guy, he's the one who killed you, Naruto stated. Most likely, Vader is the one who hunts down any surviving Jedi to eliminate them. I just hope we were able to make him regret coming after us, said Kushina. If you don't mind me asking, but what exactly are you two? Questioned Mia, making the two former Jedi look at her with Kushina narrowing her eyes at her. And who are you exactly? Kushina demanded, not liking the sight of the woman sitting next to Naruto, seeing how close the two were to each other, with the purplet smiling sweetly at her. I'm Naruto's mother, Mia Asama, Mia introduced, wanting to make it clear that she's Naruto's mother as well. Kushina narrowed her eyes further at Mia, whose smile didn't falter until the redhead smiled brightly at her. Then you have our gratitude for finding and looking after our son, Minato said smiling at the purplet, thankful that Naruto was able to grow up with a parent. Yeah, you seem to care love him very much, and will always be thankful that you found and raised him as your own. I can also tell you wouldn't let anything happen to him, added Kushina, with Mia's smile remaining even as a dark aura surrounded her and a Hanya mask appeared behind her. Of course, no one would get close to Naruto if I thought they'd mean him any harm, and anyone that tried wouldn't get the chance to regret it, stated Mia while hugging her son close much to his embarrassment. Mom, Naruto muttered, making the purplet giggle. Sorry, sweetie, 
But it's a mother's duty to make sure her child is safe, Mia said, making Kushina's smile grow. I like you. Kushina stated in approval, pleased that Naruto had Mia as his mother. And you asked what we are. Each holocron when they're created has what's known as a gatekeeper, a hologram that usually takes the form of the Jedi that creates it, with them acting as teachers to whoever finds them, while being able to sense and feel a Jedi's power to determine what knowledge will be unlocked. But some holocrons can have the consciousness of the creator imprinted in them, which is what we are, Mina To explained, much to Mia's intrigue. Fascinating. Not even the most advanced technology in Atlas has that level of intelligence, said Mia, seeing them as highly advanced AIs based on a human's consciousness. So what will you do? You said you created these holocrons to teach me. Teach me what? Naruto asked, looking at the gatekeepers. Everything that we know, but mostly how to wield the force and lightsaber combat, replied Minato, making Naruto perk up at hearing about the force and lightsabers. We'll have you start learning Form I, SHI Cho, which is the most basic of the lightsaber forms, and one that all Jedi younglings learn when they start training. Once you have a good mastery of SHI Cho, we'll move on to Form 6, Naiman, which doesn't have any specific strengths, but no weaknesses either, making it a good form to learn to incorporate using the force in your style, Kushina said, with the whiskered blonde smiling at what he'll be learning. I can also help you with your training, Naruto. You can also learn my sword style as well, Mia offered, wanting to help with her son's training as well. You're a fighter? Minato asked, with Mia smiling serenely again. I retired a few years ago, though I wouldn't really call what I do fighting, more like. I'm sent to deal with problems and then they're gone forever, stated Mia, making the red-headed Uzumaki smile at her again. I'm really starting to like you a lot, said Kushina, liking Mia's attitude. Would I be able to get a lightsaber? And what about those other holocrons? Naruto asked, wondering if he'll be able to get a lightsaber. Those holocrons, you'll need to wait before using them since they were created by my ancestors, who were considered some of the strongest force users in the galaxy. So to be trained by them, you'll need to be pretty strong already to start training under them, Kushina replied, wanting Naruto to wait until he's got a good handle of his training before using the other holocrons. As for a lightsaber, those gems and pieces you found will help you in constructing them, with the gems being what will create the blades. We found the turquoise one after we went on the run, while the violet one is known as a kyber crystal which is what's normally used in the creation of a lightsaber. With those and the parts, you'll be able to construct two lightsabers to wield, said Minato, much to Naruto's excitement that he'll be able to make his own lightsabers, which you can do after getting enough training and practice done in wielding a sword and dual wielding. So you'll be using Bakken's until then, Mia stated, wanting to make sure her son was prepared to wield actual weapons, especially ones that could end up cutting his own hand off with if he wasn't careful. Naruto nodded at his mother still happy at the chance to train with her and his birth parents, even if the latter are just holograms. Eager to begin his training and everything he'll learn under the three of them. Thank you for watching. If you liked our video, please hit the like button, subscribe for updates, and follow our Twitter, info in description. Credits go to the story's author, with details below. Don't miss out on our other content, click on the suggested video for more stories and adventures. We appreciate your support and look forward to seeing you in our next video.